Introduction to English Madrigals in the Time of Shakespeare by F. A. Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reader's Note Footnotes have been added where appropriate into the body of the text. There are references in the introduction to Appendices 1 and 2 which are not included in this recording. Chapter 1. The Early History of the Madrigal The madrigal may be defined as a piece of secular, vocal, unaccompanied part music. It is frequently set to words containing some little sentiment of worldly wisdom. The true form should consist of a series of conversational phrases, or of passages in imitation, one part answering another, and interwoven so as to form harmony. The whole should constitute one movement. Madrigals were composed for two, three, four, five, and six voices, and published in separate books for each voice, which explains a present difficulty in obtaining many of these madrigals complete. Polyphony, i.e. many melodies, is a characteristic of the madrigal, a form of composition which practically ceased about the year 1812. Modern composers follow the monodic style, i.e. one melody only, usually given to the leading voice. Madrigals were written for a musically educated people, entirely unaccompanied, and the art of rendering a number of melodies in harmony was thoroughly understood and expounded in the time of Elizabeth. Madrigals were performed without the help of any instrument, either as an assistance or to hide defects. A true explanation of the decline of madrigal singing is to be found in the fact that the people ceased to cultivate the practice of singing at sight. Consequently they lost at the same time the power of maintaining a part against other voices, and this reason still remains a potent factor against a revival of madrigal singing at the present time. The year 1500 may fairly be fixed as the date when madrigal writing first commenced, in Italy. These madrigals found their way into the other countries of Europe, and the influence of them upon English musicians soon became manifest. Early in the sixteenth century, pieces called songs were composed in this country with undoubted tendencies towards the madrigalian form. It is true that the madrigal in its true form had not at this early period found its way here, but those who study the composition of Richard Edwards, entitled In Going to My Naked Bed, which appeared in 1560, cannot fail to be struck with the resemblance it bears to the productions of the end of the century, when the term and classical form had come from Italy and Flanders. A collection of secular and sacred pieces designed for social recreation was published in the year 1530 by Winkin de Word, containing compositions of Cornish, Ashwell, Taverner, Redford, Pigott, Fairfax, Gwyneth, Jones, and Dr. Cooper. Dr. Rambo, in 1847, passed the severe criticism upon this work that the music and words were truly barbarous. An early composer of part music, Robert Fairfax, is said to have lived during the last decade of the fifteenth century. A composition of his entitled That Was My Woe Is Now My Most Gladness was considered by Dr. Burney to have been written on the accession of Henry the Seventh to the throne of England after the Battle of Bosworth Field. If this supposition be correct, a later date than 1470 cannot be assigned for his birth. About the year 1500 he was appointed organist of the Abbey of St. Albans, which possessed an organ considered the finest then in England, given to it in 1438 by Abbot John Wethamsteed. In 1502 Fairfax, who lies buried in the Abbey, received one pound for setting an anthem of Our Lady and St. Elizabeth. Another early musician was one John Redford, 
poet and dramatist, who was organist and almoner of St. Paul's Cathedral in the reign of Henry the Eighth. Tusser, the poet, a pupil of Redford, and author of A Hundredth Good Points of Husbandry, 1557, in his autobiographical poem thus mentions Redford, as master of the children of St. Paul's about 1535. But mark the chance, myself to Vance, by friendship's lot to Paul's I got. So found I grace a certain space still to remain. With Redford there the like nowhere, for cunning such and virtue much, by whom some part of music art so did I gain. The introduction of the Italian madrigal in its true form into England, in the year 1588, may safely be ascribed to a merchant, Nicholas Yong, hereafter referred to. Since its introduction, various suggestions as to its origin and derivation have been offered. It still remains an open question whether, in the land of its birth, the word originally signified religious poems addressed to the Virgin, poems of love and gallantry, or morning and evening songs, with which the lover sang his aubade or serenade under the window of his mistress. In Spain, in Old Castile, there is a town called Madrigal. Many years ago another town of the same name existed in South America. So great was the favour with which the Madrigal was received in England that it at once took root and flourished with astonishing rapidity. Every one of the native composers wrote madrigals. Upwards of ninety-two collections were published between the years 1588 and 1638, convincing evidence in itself as to the influence it had over the musician and performer alike. These facts have likewise an interest as showing the readiness of the English as a nation to accept what was best in the arts from whatever source. While the Netherlands were producing little in respect to music, which even the general enthusiasm concerning the magical could not revive, doubtless because decay had already commenced to set in, our own countrymen were eager, with that awakened life and energy which pervaded the age of Elizabeth, to venture into every unexplored region, with the success which was stamped upon all their endeavours. The results of their labours are our inheritance to this day. Erasmus, in his Moray Encomium, concerning music of the time of Henry the Eighth, says, The English could lay claim to be the best-looking, most musical, and to the best tables of any people. Englishmen have no reason to be dissatisfied with the labours of the native composers, resulting from a friendly rivalry to the Italian and Flemish masters. John Wilby, in particular, in his works, is said to have equalled, if not excelled, the greatest madrigal composers on the continent. The English musicians caught the true madrigal spirit, and although the tide of popular favour was ebbing after the accession of the first of the Stuarts, there was no perceptible falling from the standard of perfection in the compositions of John Ward or Orlando Gibbons, the English palestrina, two of the very latest of the madrigal writers. Like the fabled swan, which appeared to sing most sweetly when death approached, so with the madrigal. The suggestion has been made that Adrian Willett, who was born at Bruges in 1490, may have invented the madrigal. At any rate, he was mainly responsible for its artistic form. To his compositions, as well as to those of his successors, is mainly due the impetus given to English music. The Italian, French, and Flemish schools produced a vast number, probably to be estimated at several hundreds, many of which found their way to England, brought hither by merchants, and others who travelled for merchandise. It was generally believed at this time that English poetry would not readily lend itself to the Madrigalian form of composition. Jusserin, in the English novel in the time of Shakespeare, wrote... Long after an English nation, rich in every sort of glory, had come into being, writers are to be found hesitating to use the national idiom. 
a desire, however, soon arose to have pieces to which English words could be sung. This was met by one or two leading spirits, who caused certain Italian madrigals to be translated, and these were published in 1588 with Nicholas Yong as editor. Nicholas Yong published in 1588 a collection of Italian madrigals under the title Musica Transalpina. This was the first work in England in which the word madrigal was used. In the epistle dedicatory, Yong thus wrote, Since I first began to keep house in this city, it has been no small comfort unto me that a great number of gentlemen and merchants of good account, as well of this realm as of foreign nations, have taken in good part such entertainment of pleasure as my poor ability was able to afford them, both by the exercise of music daily used in my house, and by furnishing them with books of that kind, yearly sent me out of Italy and other places, which, being for the most part Italian songs, are for sweetness of air very well liked of all, but most in account with them that understand that language. From Musica Transalpina, Madrigals translated of four, five, and six parts, N. Yong, 1588. Included in this collection were two madrigals by William Byrd, the remainder were all by Italians, who may thus presumably lay claim to the honour of being the first Englishman to compose and publish madrigals. The success of several publications between 1588 and 1590 excited, as it was very natural to expect it would do, an emulation in the English musicians to compose original madrigals in their own language, which was so well received that from henceforth those of the Italians appear to have been neglected. The influence wielded by musicians through their compositions has been such as frequently to obliterate the element of nationality. There are cases on record where several birthplaces have been assigned to the same individual, arising from claims made for this or that musician by the inhabitants of the different countries in which they might have made a temporary or permanent residence. Absence of correct details as to dates of birth and death prevails in the cases of a large majority of the composers and musicians of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries. Positions of importance at the courts of Europe, as well as in the palaces of the nobles in foreign countries, were very frequently offered to and accepted by the English musicians during this period. Chapter 2. Influence of the Madrigal on the Music of the Time The introduction of the madrigal in English society tended to give music a fresh impulse as well as a new character. It disclosed the possibilities, up to this time unknown in England, of the art of music to add to the social and intellectual enjoyment of mankind, and to claim an attention to a practice of the art by those who are best able to judge of its merits, and at the same time best qualified by their learned attainments to take part in the performance of the gems imported into this country. Of vocal music, the madrigal appears to have been most in practice of any kind at this time, as well in England as in other countries. We learn the growing love for madrigal singing, and the patronage which the English musicians of that time received from their queen, from the dedication to the first set of William Byrd, 1588. Having observed that since the publishing of my last labours in music, divers persons of honour and worship have more esteemed and delighted in the exercise of the art than before, it has greatly encouraged me to take further pains to gratify their courteous dispositions thereunto. From Psalms, Sonnets, and Songs of Sadness and Piety by W. Bird, 1588. In the address to the reader in the same set, Bird writes that, since his last impression of music, the exercise and love of that art hath exceedingly increased. That madrigal singing was a favourite amusement of the time is a fact resting upon undoubted evidence, 
and confirmed by the large supply of materials adapted to gratify the growing taste for this form of music. Without going beyond such as have come within our own reach, some idea may be formed of its extent from the necessarily imperfect list in Appendix II. Excluding a large number of inferior compositions, there are extant at least a thousand English madrigals by composers of name and note. This fact in itself shows clearly the state and general cultivation of musical knowledge at this period, while all the evidence available points to the same conclusion. A foreign resident in England by the name of Galliard has left the following account of English music in the time of Shakespeare. He wrote, Madrigals were much in use in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, in which compositions the English of that time have left proof of their ability even to vie with the best Italian composers. Nobody could then pretend to a liberal education, who had not made such a progress in music as to be able to sing his part at sight, and it was usual, when ladies and gentlemen met, for madrigal books to be laid before them, and every one to sing their part. I believe every one is sensible of the difficulty there would be at present, of finding among the lovers of music a sufficient number qualified for such a performance. But since the glorious reign of Queen Elizabeth, music, for which, as well as her sister arts, England was then renowned all the world over, has been so much neglected, as much by the little encouragement it has received from the great, as by reason of the civil wars, that at length this art was entirely lost. The singing of the part-songs, which soon became one of the chief social recreations of the period, continued to charm all lovers of vocal harmony for many years. Such madrigals, for instance, as those by John Wilby, must have been known to his near neighbour Sir Thomas Gresham, and doubtless Wilby was a welcome and not infrequent guest at the mansion in Broad Street. Accepting the evidence from contemporary authority for the fact that madrigal singing formed the customary entertainment after dinner in all polished circles, it requires but a small demand on our belief to imagine that the madrigals of Wilby, Bird, and the other English composers were not seldom heard within the walls of Gresham's house, and that in the performance of them Gresham himself was accustomed to join. Dr. W. A. Barrett suggested that Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, Sir Walter Raleigh, and many others who contributed to the madrigal poetry of the period, were frequent listeners, as well as performers, at Wilby's house in Austin Friars. The father of John Milton the poet was himself a madrigal composer. The custom prevailed throughout the reign of Elizabeth, and extended into that of James I. Many names familiar to all readers were able to take their share in this universal custom of madrigal singing. Slowly but effectively a cloud gathered over the fair prospect of native music, which appeared soon after the accession of the Stuarts. The influence of the madrigal, as also its place amongst the social enjoyments of the people, were soon to be numbered as things belonging to the past golden age of Elizabeth. There are perhaps more reasons for the decay of the madrigal than the one regarding the want of favour shown towards the composers on the part of James I. The madrigal could only be performed by a number of voices. The song, with the instrumental accompaniment, on the other hand, by one voice. Again, the perfection of the lute, the viol, the virginal and other instruments introduced entirely new features into music. Chapter 3. Shakespeare and Other Poets, Their Part in the Madrigal The madrigal collections of the time of Shakespeare contain many choice specimens of lyrical poetry. At the same time, it must be conceded that a large number of the Elizabethan madrigals were set to words too frequently characterised by mediocrity. A writer in the early part of this century remarked that the madrigal was a species of vocal harmony 
very elegant in its structure, and adapted to such poetry as was fit to be sung or uttered in the hearing of the most polite and well-bred persons. Such collections of lyrical poetry as The Paradise of Dainty Devices, 1576, England's Helicon, 1600, The Golden Garland of Princely Delights, 1620, amongst others, various editions of which appeared in the 16th and 17th centuries, contained lyrics set in the madrigal form by some of the best composers of this period. Although discussion during the last two hundred years has left the derivation of the word madrigal still doubtful, it is certain that the character of the poetry is distinctly pastoral. The prevailing belief that English poetry was too harsh and unyielding to be readily coupled with the pleasant note was noticed in a former chapter. The experiment once made, this prejudice to the use of native verse was soon disposed of. The first book of songs or airs of four parts, issued by John Dowland in 1597, contains My Thoughts Are Winged With Hopes, the initials W.S. being appended to it in a manuscript of the time preserved in the Hamburg City Library. Three Madrigals by Thomas Wilkes, My Flocks Feed Not, etc., are with but little authority ascribed to Shakespeare. They are contained in The Passionate Pilgrim, a collection of poetry, as Mr. Polgrave says in The Golden Treasury of Songs and Lyrics, published by a speculative bookmaker in 1599. A few of the pieces may with certainty be said to be by Shakespeare, a very few of which are dubious, and several either demonstrably not his, or bearing internal signs of other authorship. Sigh No More, Ladies, was set by Thomas Ford. In many instances the poetry appeared for the first time in the various musical collections which appeared during this period. The Madrigals of Bird, Dowland, Pilkington, Bateson and Ward, published between the years 1588 and 1624, were set to the poetry of Sir Philip Sidney. My true love hath my heart, in a grove most rich of shade, go my flocks get you hence, come shepherd's weeds, O oh, sweet woods, may be mentioned. Alfonso Ferrabosco, who settled in England very early in life, is said to have set many of the lyrics contained in the masks and plays of Ben Jonson. His well-known Come, My Celia, Let Us Prove was published in 1609 in a collection composed by Ferrabosco, and Slow, Slow, Fresh Fount appeared in 1608, set by Henry Yule. There is good reason to believe that the words of all the pieces in Morley's first book, dated 1595, were written by Michael Drayton. Bright Star of Beauty occurs in a set which saw the light in 1622 by John Atty. Fond Love is Blind, from Barnfield's Affectionate Shepherd, 1594, appeared in Bateson's second set, 1618. During the years 1607 to 14, Thomas Campion, Doctor of Medicine, poet and madrigal writer, produced four books, the poetry almost entirely his own. The pieces set by Philip Rossiter and published in 1601 were also by Campion. In 1612, Orlando Gibbons gave to the admirers of the madrigal a collection for five voices, consisting of twenty. For some considerable time the whole of the verses were attributed to Sir Christopher Hatton. As a set-off to this, Dr. Rambo says that some are by Dr. Dunn and others by Joshua Sylvester. The truth probably is that Hatton merely selected the poetry for Gibbons. Richard Carlton, in 1601, selected three at least of the stanzas of Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, Nought is on earth more sacred or divine, Ye gentle ladies in whose sovereign power, And nought under heaven so strongly doth allure, For a set of madrigals to five voices. More than most fair, also from the Fairy Queen, appeared in 1630, 
arranged by Martin Pearson. John Dowland, the greatest lute player of the time of Elizabeth, has been described as the friend of Shakespeare and the companion of the leading poets of his time. From the Polyhymnia, 1590, of George Peel, he selected His Golden Locks Time Hath to Silver Turned, and published it in his first book in 1597. Melpomene, the Muse of Tragic Songs, from the Arraignment of Paris, 1584, by George Peel, served to inspire the madrigal of Thomas Vorter, produced in 1619 in his first set. In the England's Helicon already mentioned, there are several lyrics by Anthony Munday, i.e. Shepherd Tony. Beauty Sate Bathing alone being used by William Corkine, Robert Jones and Francis Pilkington. The question of the authenticity of some of the poems found in these collections of madrigals renders the task of identification very difficult. In fact, the anonymous list will always remain an extensive one. Sir Walter Raleigh is, however, responsible for at least two, viz. What is Our Life, The Play of Passion, from the collection of Orlando Gibbons, and Like Hermit Poor, In Pensive Place Obscure. The wide choice open to the madrigal composers of the age of Shakespeare may thus be recognised, and when a further list, merely of names, of lyrical writers is given, some idea may readily be formed of the number and activity of the Elizabethan poets. The inferences to be drawn from these facts are, first, that the demand and patronage extended towards these writers of madrigals must have been extensive. Second, the adaptability of this school of lyric poetry for the purposes of the madrigal. Among many others who have enriched the lyrical poetry of England are Dr. Dunn, Robert Green, Fulk Greville, Lord Brooke, Shepherd Tony, or Anthony Munday, to accept the recent identification of Mr. A. H. Bullen, Joshua Sylvester, John Lyley, Henry Constable, Thomas Lodge, Francis Kinwellmersh, Thomas Watson, Nicholas Breton, Edward Vere, Earl of Oxford, John Wootton, Thomas Middleton, Samuel Daniel, William Brown, Edmund Bolton, Anthony Brewer, and M. Thorne. It has been stated by more than one writer that it is also worthy of remark that the words of all madrigals, with the single exception of the Madrigali Spirituali of Palestrina, are of a secular, sprightly, or witty nature. Dr. Rambo, in his Bibliotheca Madrigaliana, 1847, in reference to an attempt to gather a complete collection of Madrigalian poetry for publication, mentions that a prospectus was issued in 1816, to the effect that such a project was contemplated, but from some cause or other not explained, the promised work never appeared. In the choice of the words for their madrigals, the composers appear to have allowed themselves much latitude. The sonnet, the stanza, the lyric, the satirical and love poem were forms apparently equally suited to the musical madrigal. To sum up these remarks on the poetry of the madrigal, an opinion, G. Saintsbury, A History of Elizabethan Literature, 1887, has been expressed that such an outflow of verse within the confines of a quarter of a century can find no parallel in the literary history of any other nation in the world. Further, that it seldom occurs that the whole poem constitutes a gem, but a verse here and there, like a flash, is found. Chapter 4 Principal Madrigal Composers the practice of madrigal writing was so far engrossing as to include among its partisans the principal composers of the era. William Byrd, around 1540 to 1623, belonged to the parish of St. Helen's Bishopsgate, and resided opposite to Crosby Hall, adjoining the garden of Sir Thomas Gresham. He published three collections of part music, and headed the list so far as number of compositions was concerned, in all he was responsible for 114 single pieces. 
Bird probably owed his musical education, with Tai, Tallis, and others, to the monastic institutions, where, before the Reformation, music was principally cultivated by the monks. John Wilby, around 1560 to around 1612, is chiefly known as a writer of madrigals. Contemporary report described him as a musician of rare endowments. He published two sets of madrigals, which contained all but three of his entire vocal compositions known. These sets give us sixty-four specimens, the merits of which are said to have gained him the enviable fame of being the greatest of the English madrigalian composers. The editor of Wilby's works for the Musical Antiquarian Society in 1846 says, The variety of character and colouring which adorns the madrigals of this great writer is surprising, considering the prescribed range in which the harmonist of this period was accustomed and trained to walk. John Dowland, 1562 to around 1626, was born in the city of Westminster where, says Thomas Fuller, he had his longest life and best livelihood. He was unquestionably a greater lute-player than madrigal composer, though even in the latter he excelled. Fuller further tells us that Christian IV, King of Denmark, coming over into England, requested him of King James, who, unwillingly willing, parted with him. He appears to have spent many years at the court of the King of Denmark, and during that period published three sets for voices. In all he published four. Dowland composed sixty-four madrigals. His skill on the lute was mentioned by the dramatists Ben Jonson, Middleton, Fletcher, Massinger, Barnfield, and in one of the sonnets ascribed to Shakespeare. The criticism by Dr. Burney passed upon Dowland as a madrigal composer, has been described as an inconsiderate depreciation of his talents. Thomas Morley, 1563-1604, has been remembered by posterity more particularly for his official connection with The Triumphs of Oriana, the subject of our next chapter. He published eight other collections, containing upwards of ninety-three of his own compositions. A solemn burial service by him, the first perhaps of the kind ever known in England, continued to be performed at public funerals until it gave way to those of Purcell and Croft. John Bennett, around 1565 to around 1605, is reputed to have been one of the best composers of the Elizabethan period. There appears to be less known concerning his career than even of the majority of musicians. Churches containing, as they did, the registers which were burned in the great fire, would have placed many points now in dispute, beyond a doubt. Bennett published but one set of madrigals, containing seventeen, and a further six were contained in a work edited by Thomas Ravenscroft in the year 1614 in the preface to which he is mentioned as Maester John Bennett, a gentleman admirable for all kinds of composures, either in art or air, simple or mixed, of what nature soever, in whose works the very life of that passion which the ditty sounded is so truly expressed, as if he had measured it alone by his own soul, and invented no other harmony than his own sensible feeling did afford him. Francis Pilkington, around 1570 to around 1625, describes himself as a bachelor of music and lutenist on the title pages of his three publications. Dr. Burney, who apparently knew very little about the madrigal, speaks slightingly also of this composer. He nevertheless possessed a strong patron in Ferdinand, 5th Earl of Derby, and has left us no less than sixty-nine examples of his industry and ability. Thomas Wilkes, born 1575, was very young when he gave to the world some of the best productions of his life. He was but twenty-two 
when the first set of madrigals appeared by him, that is, in the year 1597. He subsequently issued four more sets, totalling ninety-four compositions in all. A recent criticism thus speaks of him. His works are distinguished by originality and excellent part-writing, as well as by a certain characteristic stiffness. Many of them are still popular, and have been often reprinted. The position of Wilkes among his Madrigalian contemporaries is deservedly a high one. Thomas Bateson, around 1580 to around 1620, was appointed organist to Chester Cathedral at the age of nineteen. He is said to have been the first to receive a musical degree in the University of Dublin. He was responsible for fifty-nine compositions, and published two sets of madrigals. Dr. Rambo says, There can be but little difference of opinion as regards the merits of Bateson, when judged by comparison with his contemporaries, and with reference to those old tonal laws which alike guided the secular as well as the ecclesiastical writers of the Elizabethan school. His reputation rests upon the first set of madrigals, but these suffice to establish it. Thomas Ford, 1580-1648, was one of the musicians of Henry, Prince of Wales, son of James I. In 1607, he published Music of Sundry Kinds, two parts, the first contains the celebrated Since First I Saw Your Face, and There Is a Lady Sweet and Kind. A copy of this work is very rare, if any perfect copy exists. Nevertheless, some of its contents, and such as make us wish for more, are well known. There were probably eleven madrigals in this collection. Michael East, born around 1580, is only known to dabblers in music by his How Merrily We Live for Three Voices, which has served to enrich almost every subsequent collection of vocal harmony, whose various compilers from previous compilations have never thought it worth while to see whether its author might not have produced another composition of equal merit. With the assistance of my colleague, Mr. R. E. Strickland, who has scored it, I have unearthed a four-part madrigal entitled In Dolorous Complaining, taken from the second set of madrigals, 1606, and I hope to have it published, as well as publicly performed. East's publications are much more numerous than those of any composer of his time. Between 1604 and 1638 he published seven sets with a total of forty-six madrigals to his credit. Orlando Gibbons, 1583 to around 1627, was organist to Canterbury Cathedral. He published but one set of madrigals, twenty in number, in 1612. His Silver Swan is generally considered to be the most perfect work of the kind of the English school. Its wonderful conciseness, the exceeding beauty of each part, and the charm of its melodic treatment fully explain its lasting popularity. The year 1612 was thus signalised by the appearance of a set of madrigals which may rank among the highest of their class. Gibbons was one of the latest, as he was one of the greatest, of the noble body of musicians to which he belonged. John Hilton, around 1600 to 1657, was organist and parish clerk of St. Margaret's Westminster. It is assumed that he was compelled to resign the post of organist in 1644, when all organs were ordered to be taken down, and the church appears to have been without one until after the Restoration. He is said to have been an ingenious and sound musician, although not a voluminous composer. He published his sole original work in 1627, containing twenty-six pieces, but the great work of his life was not produced until after an interval of twenty-five years. 
This was Catch That Catch Can, to which twenty-one composers contributed. The curious, who desire information concerning the other Madrigalian writers, must seek the authorities, of whom there are many. Appendix I to this volume gives approximate date of birth and death, where it has been possible to discover the same, of the most renowned writers of the period. Chapter V. Collection of Madrigals Made in Honour of Elizabeth The Triumphs of Oriana, 1601 Twenty-seven madrigals, The Triumphs of Oriana, and one called The Farewell, to five and six voices, composed by divers several authors, newly published by Thomas Morley, Bachelor of Music, and one of the gentlemen of Her Majesty's Honourable Chapel. 1601 in London, printed by Thomas East, the assign of Thomas Morley, cum privilegio regia maestatis. The origin of this celebrated collection of madrigals still remains a disputed matter, and before entering upon a full account of the work, it will be more proper to quote what some authorities have left on record so that each reader may form his or her own opinion. Let us begin by a quotation from A General History of the Science and Practice of Music by Sir John Hawkins, published in 1776. There is some piece of secret history which we are yet to learn that would enable us to account for the giving the Queen this romantic name. Probably she was fond of it. As a set-off to this, Camden, the antiquary, relates that the Spanish ambassador, in one of his letters, had spoken of the Queen under the name Oriana, at which she was much offended. Dr. Rambo, in the Leisure Hour for 1875, wrote with confidence that the celebrated triumphs of Oriana were written in praise of England's Elizabeth, whilst in 1847, that is, twenty-eight years earlier, he thus wrote, in his Bibliotheca Madrigaliana, This set of madrigals was written in honour of Queen Elizabeth, who figures under the name of Oriana. Sir John Hawkins supposed that the work was undertaken with a view to alleviate her grief for the death of the Earl of Essex, and that prizes were given by the Earl of Nottingham for the best compositions for that purpose, but this is mere idle conjecture. The writer of the article in the British and Foreign Review, 1845, merely reiterated the opinion of Sir John Hawkins. Dr. W. A. Barrett, in English Glees and Part Songs, 1886, thus describes the work. There are twenty-seven pieces in this collection, all in praise of Oriana, the fanciful name by which Queen Elizabeth was distinguished by certain poets of the time and, in English Madrigal Composers, a published lecture, read at the London Institution, January 18th, 1877, is the following. In these compositions some writers suppose that Queen Elizabeth was glorified under the fanciful title of Oriana, because the collection is dedicated to the Earl of Nottingham. So much for the authorities. Now for the full account, as given by Sir John Hawkins. The collection was printed in 1601, although for some reason or another not published until two years after. It seems by the work itself as if all the musicians of Queen Elizabeth's time, who were capable of composing, had endeavoured each to excel the others in setting a song, celebrating the beauties and virtues of their sovereign. For the triumphs of Oriana, it appears that the following musicians contributed, viz., Michael East, Daniel Norcom, John Mundy, Ellis Gibbons, John Bennett, John Hilton, George Marson, Richard Carlton, John Holmes, Richard Nicholson, Thomas Tomkins, Michael Cavendish, William Cobbold, Thomas Morley, John Farmer, John Wilby, Thomas Hunt, Thomas Wilkes, John Milton, George Kirby, Robert Jones, John Leslie and Edward Johnson. 
The occasion of this collection is said to be this. The Lord High Admiral Charles Howard, Earl of Nottingham, was the only person, during the last illness of Elizabeth, who was able to prevail on her to go into and remain in her bed, and with a view to alleviate her concern for the execution of the Earl of Essex, he gave, for a prize subject to the poets and musicians of the time, the beauty and accomplishments of his royal mistress, and by a liberal reward excited them severally to the composition of this work. This supposition is favoured by the circumstance of its being dedicated to the Earl, and the time of its publication, which was in the very year that Essex was beheaded. The title and plan of the work were doubtless suggested by a similar Italian one, published at Rome in 1599, with the title Il Trionfo di Dori. To quote from another author, as Italy gave the ton to the rest of Europe, but particularly to England, in all the fine arts during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, it seems as if the idea of employing all the best composers in the kingdom to set the songs in the triumphs of Oriana to music, in honour of our Virgin Queen, had been suggested to Morley and his patron the Earl of Nottingham by Padre Giovanale, afterwards Bishop of Saluzzo who employed thirty-seven of the most renowned Italian composers to set canzonetti and madrigals in honour of the Virgin Mary, published under the following title, Temper Armonico della Beatissima Vergine Nostra Signora, Fabricatole per Opera del Reverendo de Giovanale, Ape della Congregazione del Oratoria, Prima Parte, a Tre Voci. Stampata in Roma da Niccolo Muti, quindici novanta nove, in quarto. Dr. Rambo says that the Italian collection was made in praise of some Italian dame, published before the year 1597. The only unprofessional contributor to the triumphs of Oriana was the father of Milton the poet. The theme of every madrigal in the collection is similar and the burden of each the same. Then sang the shepherds and nymphs of Diana, Long live fair Oriana. The contents of this work necessarily vary in excellence. Wilby, Wilkes, Bennet and Morley preserving their usual station. In conclusion, let me quote a very just appreciation of the work. If the Queen merited such a tribute of loyalty and gratitude from the musicians of her age, she received in turn an enviable requital. Her praises are wrought into lasting monuments of art. And Mr. W. H. Husk, librarian to the Sacred Harmonic Society, the writer of the article in A Dictionary of Music and Musicians, 1880, concerning this collection, says... The Italian work just named is entitled Il Trionfo di Dori, descritto da diversi et posti in musica da detritante autori, a sei foci, written in praise of a lady who is figured under the name of Doris, each of which ends with the words Viva la bella Dori. End of The Introduction to English Madrigals in the Time of Shakespeare by F. A. Cox. Read by Ruth Golding.